business idea needs a website, so go to Wix.com. What are you waiting for? Boop. Turn that off. Let's see who we got. Do, 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 do. All right, looks like we've got about 25 people, 30 people. Hello from Manchester, UK. How's it going? Mark Croft, good to see you here. Thank you. Nathan, what's up? Blaze Cannon, nice. Good to see you again, buddy. Catch the live for a while now. Nice. Ziggy the Cartoon, I appreciate you stopping in. Oh, I need to send a text. So, good morning, everybody. Well, I guess it's 12.09, so it's just barely afternoon on the East Coast. How's it going? Hello from Canada. Hello from Texas. Jeffrey Graham. Denmark. Nud Sorensen. Greetings from Virginia. Robert Gilkerson. Greetings, everybody. Hello, hello. Let me send my uncle a text real quick. All right. Live stream. South America, Chile. 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 Slovakia, Tampa, South America, South Carolina. What we got? Ziggy, Isabella Donna, Chile. Christopher Weber's from Tampa. Domcher 014 is from Slovakia. Hello, hello. Jerry Harrison from Nashville, Tennessee. Jim Hamlin from Ohio, the Hoosier State. Luke Ikbora from India. Jaeger, Bedfordshire in the UK. And Andrea Gerano, wait, Gennaro, Gennaro, Italy. Dustin Chavers, that guy has a good name right there. From Alabama. Colorado, Indiana. Man, we got people from everywhere. That's great. All right, well, welcome, guys. Uh, we are going to be doing a live axe hanging today. Um, I posted a picture of this axe, <clears throat> which is a nice uh, Connecticut pattern. This is one I found up at an antique store up in Vermont. Um, and... Um, great like old pitting all over it. I cleaned it up, got all the rust off, um, has beautiful patina and I sharpened it, but I don't have a handle that I want to put this on. Uh, I thought I did, but I don't. So I want to put this on a shorter handle, maybe a 24 or 26, 28 inch handle, something like that. All the handles I have are in the 32 to 36 inch range. So I switched my idea and today I will be hanging <clears throat> this council tool. This is a nice, uh, it's a kind of a jersey. It does have these lugs here that come down, which make it, you know, a jersey pattern. Sometimes rock away, sometimes um, different things like that. But I think this has got a little bit of a point, just kind of the tiniest bit of points. Uh, so I'm pretty sure this is a type of, you know, kind of a minimal jersey. So these lugs hang down just a little bit. Um, this has a really nice shaped eye, really clean. Um, I will have to chamfer the bottom edge of this eye a little bit because it's pretty sharp. Um, and I'm going to clean it up on the wire wheel. It's got a little bit of rust on it, but it looks like it's in pretty pristine condition. You can see there's this kind of paint line at an angle, which is what Council Tool does. I really like that. It's got the Council, Council Tool stamp on the front and USA on the back. Um, and it has this sticker on the front paper label, which I am going to remove. So I'm going to do some wire wheeling, just kind of clean it up a little bit. We'll do a little bit of uh, chamfering under the eye and then we'll move on from there. <clears throat> I do have a kind of this nice um, dark patinaed vintage handle, which is kind of slim, which is nice. Um, and <clears throat> I can get it started. So I'm moving about that much or so. So maybe two inches already into the head. So it's a good start. I just need to take down the back. It fills up the eye really nicely. So I'm happy with that. So it's a good place to start this vintage handle. <clears throat> so I think we're going to start by just doing a little bit of wire wheeling. Let's see what we got. Do, 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 do. Nathan, Drew O'Hara from Maryland. That's my brother. Welcome. Thanks for watching. Uh, how's the sound, guys? <clears throat> Let me know. Caught that burp on the sound. That's good. Sculpture 
Sauvage, sauvage. Bonjour de la France Alps. From the French Alps. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. <whistles> Evening, Sean. Sean Nod. Sean was from... Uh, don't tell me, Sean. Somewhere in Canada, I want to say... Ontario? Maybe Ontario? Oh, that doesn't sound great. All right. Sounds great. Good. Wandering Canuck, greetings from Ottawa. Hello, hello, Wandering, wandering Canuck. <clears throat> we have family up in Ottawa, our cousins on my mom's side. We were actually up there last October. <clears throat> Man, <clears throat> all right. Ooh, picture on a 70 inch TV. Woo, looks better on my phone. <laughs> a little janky on that giant TV, yeah. How is the new grinder treating you? The new grinder is amazing. It's behind you guys right now, so you can't see it, but it's amazing. It's super nice, really easy to work. Um, I have the one, one horsepower motor on it, which has been great. I've you know put as much pressure as I want onto it. My only problem now is I actually need to figure out where on the table I want to put that um, grinder, so that way I can bolt it down, and I want to put this grinder as well there. This is my uh, one horsepower 2x42. Um, Black and Decker Sears or Sears Craftsman, which I really like this one too, and it has the um, the disc on the end as well. So I want to set those both up on that table and set up some type of dust collection system. So still deciding how I want to do that. I, you know, it's hard to make that decision and then be locked into it. Uh, but I'm also going to be cleaning up the area behind it. I have this kind of shelving unit that doesn't really hold anything super important. It's just a bunch of stuff. It's just like a catch space for things. So I'm going to move that. Uh, move the table back a little bit so I have a little bit more space on that end of the room. And then uh, we'll actually be doing kind of a, a cool uh, Art of Craftsmanship sign build in the future. So watch out for that. That'll be cool. <clears throat> a little late, but made it. Oh, yeah, Alan Brown, man, you're here. Only a few minutes late. That's okay. I just barely started it. Randy shouting from Indiana, fellow outdoorsman. All right, virtual dinner party. Hello from Canada. Crafting a life I want is here. Thank you, buddy. Good to see you. My buddy Sean from Crafting a Life I Want just got a really nice, um, uh, like, uh, what's it called? Like a woodworker's vice that goes on the side. Nice crank one with a, a bench dog that slides up and down. He just picked it up. Um, got it for a really good deal. And he reached out to me yesterday. We were kind of talking about it and looking up some information on it. It looks like it's a good deal. Um, it's a kind of a funny brand, but I think it's a brand uh, that is um, primar primarily sold to schools and education. So it's something where like you get a good quality, but not the price and the, the price point of like a name brand. So should be good. Bench Vice. Yeah. Hello from New Market, New Hampshire. Howard Mosley. Good to see you. That's my wife's uncle. And... Uh, Good guy, I'm glad he's here. He was the one I was texting if you guys saw from the very beginning. He's here now. Shane Solutions. All right. How would, if you put a polished blue on the ax head, how would it look? A polished blue. Um, I do have cold blue, um, Birchwood Casey cold blue. I haven't actually used it on any of my ax heads yet, but I'm sure it would look awesome. This has some red paint on it. I'm gonna be wire wheeling off a lot of the rust and a lot of this paint's gonna come off with it. Um, and I'm not too worried about uh, repainting it. I like the look of, you know, like fully restored heads, but I'm gonna use it all the time. So uh, but this is a nice, it's got a good weight to it. Let's, let's weigh it. <clears throat> let's see what we got. Well, all right. So set that to zero. Put that in there. Actually, no. Let's just take this off. Just like this. Back to zero. And put that. it is almost exactly three and a half pounds. So it's not super huge, but it's one of the bigger ones that I have, and has a really nice wide bit. That's why I'm going to use a longer handle for it. More of a felling axe has a nice narrow bit. <clears throat> so, you know, a felling axe would have a longer narrow bit compared to more of a splitting axe, which might look like, let's see. Any of these splitting, this is more, I guess, 
Oh, that's pretty narrow too. I'll show you. <clears throat> so something like this, we have, um, this is a splitting, so it has like more of a full wedge shape where it's narrow at the top and then a full wedge all the way down into the head. So you get a nice splitter compared to like this, which is a feller. So this one kind of is more narrow in the bit, comes down and then widens out, out to the cheeks and the, fit the rest of the head. So a nice long, thin bit, which is good for, you know, tree felling and Nice, good, deep cutting. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to start by doing a little bit of wire wheeling. I just have a regular steel wire wheel on my grinder here uh, that I like to use most of that just kind of general rust remover. And I'm gonna use a little bit of WD-40, but I'll just start it dry. Um, then put a little, kind of clean off a little bit of stuff and get the WD-40 on and work a little bit more. So let's see, let me check on comments real quick. Hershey PA, one, two. <laughs> and Greg McKinney, McKinley, good to see you from Washington. Vene Veterinary 67 from Malaysia, good morning, good morning. Tom Carlson. All right. So let me put on my respirator. Oh, uh, chance to look into the knife logo, Mike. Mike, where did you send it? Uh, let's see. The knife logo or knife design? Mike Nickel. I think he's talking about through Instagram. Let me look real quick. I'll give you some feedback live, but maybe you sent it through email. C H O L, Mike. Uh, bum, 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 bum. cancel. Let's go here. Mike, Mike, Mike. Uh, no, 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 no. I don't see it, man. Uh, search for accounts. Mike sent through Instagram. Mike, this is riveting content. And I C H. All right, Mike. Um, Mike Nickel, five. Oh, right. Um, I have not. Um, yes, and I did see it. I think I, did I comment. I think I did comment. Yes, um, I posted that to a knife making group, and I haven't heard anything back yet. Um, I couldn't really see it super clearly, uh, and but I but I kind of I put my feelers out there, so I'm working on it for you. I think um, one of the knife making groups. I'm part of a couple knife making groups, so. Um, I put that out there and hopefully we'll get some feedback and uh, I'll let you know. All right. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to do a little bit of grinding. So got my eye protection, respirator and grinder behind me. I'll clean it up and I'll show you guys how it's looking.
looking good so it's really nice the wd-40 just then penetrates into some of that rust and gets a little bit deeper in which is nice gives a nice finish so we'll go ahead and clean this off and then we'll do a little bit of grinding or a little bit of filing at the bottom and then we'll start fitting it Hello from Southeast Texas. Whew. North Carolina. First sheath using all your tips. Awesome. Graham Harding is making a sheath. That's so sweet. Put this back up here. Okay. Boop -a -boop -a -bee. Big high from Ireland. Not a Sazuj. That's the last we get. Two X heads. All right. Cyber Troll. Good job. Have a nice day. All right. Doing another instructional video on making hammer or hatchet handles. Um, hammer or hatchet handles. I will be doing, um, I'll be handling, rehandling a boy's axe soon. Uh, and then I have. Um, 
actually a where is it? Kind of a cool hatchet head and handle. This is a True Temper Tommy Axe. Uh, I mentioned this in one of the other live streams, but this handle is octagonal at the top. So there's some facets. I don't know if you can see it, but um, octagonal at the top and then round at the bottom. This is a big chip out at the bottom and it's split. So I need to make a new one of these. So that'll be kind of fun. I'll probably do a video on that. Um, just, you know, showing how you would do the transition between octagonal to round. All right. Okay, let me get this little quick wipe down. So what I said I'm going to be doing is getting a little bit of a chamfer, chamfer to the bottom of the eye. And I'm going to do that because right now the bottom of the eye is really sharp. So just like a really sharp edge, which is like a really clean casting, but I want it to be tapered so that way when I fit this onto the axe handle, it has a way to wedge onto the handle instead of cut into the handle. I don't want it to cut in and create what we call a ninja shelf, which is basically just like a shelf that it's going to sit on. I want it to be wedging in the whole time. So I use uh, chainsaw files. I have a couple of them here, a couple of different sizes. So just round chainsaw files. Uh, and I'll be using these to get inside that the bottom of the eye and putting a little bit of a chamfer there. Hello, mom. My mom is on as my dad. <laughs> Be careful, that's not lead paint on the ax head. Uh, this is a newer ax head, probably from, uh, I would say, could be 80s or 90s so it's most likely not but i was on my respirator so should be good possible to make a sheath from four mil leathered i ordered it by accident it was meant to be 3.5 mil it's my first one wait so your difference is a half a mil that shouldn't be any problem um i mean you can make a sheath out of anything it's just going to be uh, you might want to sky a little bit in some areas which means just to take some material off so thin it out so if like you're having trouble for, with a bend like bending really cleanly and snapping or something if you're doing a sheath that way um if it's just you know i mean as long as you wet it and soak it it'll bend really easily and you can use thick leather i've used i usually use seven to eight ounce leather which uh it's probably Let's see, 7.8 is, it's like 5 sixteenths, so just over, just over an eighth of an inch, which is, oh, I do have millimeters on the other side, so that is 1, 2, 3, 4, Looks like maybe four mil. Yeah, so that's probably just about right. Um, four mil might be closer to like a nine, 10 ounce, which I've also made sheaths out of and it works fine. It's a little heavy, but it works. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and clamp this in. I have wooden jaws in my vise here. So I'll clamp this into the vise. Again, make sure you're not uh, you know, make sure you're not clamping this into your metal vise without some type of wood or something to protect it. And you're just going to get those teeth marks on the outside of the axe head. It's not the end of the world, but it doesn't look great. All right. So I have, again, chainsaw file, and I'm just working at an angle just to put a little bit of a chamfer. And I don't have a lot of real estate to move around in here. I can only push in so far before the, I hit the other side of the eye. So kind of just working what I can, a lot of times I'll kind of put it in and pull it toward me, kind of rotate it as I go. And that just helps to give just enough of a chamfer, just trying to clean off that really sharp edge, put a nice little chamfer on the inside and 
uh, I would say my final champ for like width, you know, the width of how much I'm chamfering might be anywhere between like a 16th to maybe an eighth. Eight might be more than I need, probably around a 16th. Just trying to get a nice gentle taper into the eye. Sometimes this will take a really long time because the eyes can be different hardnesses. Usually your the majority of your ax head is gonna be softened uh, except for the bit, which will be hardened. Um, and that is definitely the case with this one, which is nice. It makes it nice and easy for me to add this chamfer. Uh, oh, <laughs> why not use a power tool? Um, I don't know, because, you know, the hand tools are here. You know, with the amount of time it would take me to take out the Dremel, get the right tool inside. Um, the I'd have to use, like I have a drum sanding bit for my Dremel, which might work. Um, I have some little stone tips that might work, but uh, this usually works quick enough and I can kind of control how much I do. So I like to use the chainsaw files. And that's, um, I mean, almost halfway done, so it really doesn't take too much time. Like I said, I have, there have been other times before where the eye's been a lot harder than I would have expected, so it took me some more time. But usually for the amount of time it takes, it's not really, I don't know, it's just, qu as, just as quick, if not, you know, a little bit slower, just to do it by hand. <laughs> so the question was, does, is that on here? Yeah. Um, just mistakes. Just mistakes. Oh, like doing mistakes while I'm working live. Um, no, I don't know. I, not really. I mean, that's, that's just part of what it is, I guess. You know, being a maker, you're always, you hope that the process goes smoothly and that you don't make any mistakes along a maker or a crafter or an artist is dealing with those mistakes as you go. So there's always what you expect to happen while you're making something or while you're restoring something. And then there's always something that happens that's a little different. And then it's just, you know, thinking on your feet and, you know, doing what you need to do to make sure you can finish the project the way you want to. Cutting my ledge curve before I shape the handle to fit, to fit the axis. Do you see coming? Uh, slightly. So the question was, or well, the question is that, um, is there a problem with cutting the kerf on the axe head before you fit the head? Now, most axes that you get, axe handles, if you buy an axe handle from the store, it's going to have the kerf already cut into it. This one has the kerf cut in because it was pulled off another axe head. So it's already there, cut in. Um, when I'm making an ax handle from scratch, I don't cut the kerf first. And the reason why is because when you cut the kerf, then as you're fitting the ax head onto the handle, it's compressing that kerf. So later when you put the head on and you wanna put your wedge in, now your kerf is super tight and super smashed together because you've been fitting it through. Now, you obviously can work around that. You can you know, leave some material on the side of the ax, uh, the top of the ax head so that way, or the ax handle so that way it stays open. But if you can fit it before you cut the kerf, in my experience, it's worked pretty well to be able to uh, be able to fit it really nicely, get it to fit well, nice and tight in there, and then cut your kerf. So then you have this nice, you know, thin kerf, which is not smashed all the way closed. So that would be my advice. All right. Hello. Hello. My in-laws are watching. Mosley's, good to see you guys here. That's it, Dave. Hi. 
So this axe head has a little bit of a, a ridge around the, uh, the top, which would be even sharper to cut in because it kind of tapers down to the bottom of the eye. Um, so this is even more important because instead of acting just like a sharp corner, this is actually a bevel, which could really cut in to your ax head and split it. So at this point, it's really important to chamfer and smooth that out. That's why I'm going across a little bit because it's pretty sharp there. What type of wood is it? I have not said yet because I'm not sure. I'm assuming it's hickory. It looks like hickory. It's, it's uh, kind of the patina like an old piece of hickory and has a really nice, really nice grain. You won't be able to see it yet, but I'll, I'll clean this up a little bit later and I'll show you guys the grain. So the grain orientation is nice and tight and it's all running exactly parallel with the handle this way. So it'd be parallel with the way you're gonna hang the ax head. And that's what you want. That gives the strongest, um, is the strongest orientation for your grain for an ax handle. Now I'm being extra particular about chamfering the ends of these lugs really well because when you're hanging an axe head that has lugs, you have to worry about that material coming, the axe head material coming down deeper onto the, uh, onto the handle. And it can be kind of tricky to get those to fit really well as opposed to just an axe head with a straight bottom which fits all evenly. So a lot of people want to kind of cut out material for those cheeks. It's not necessarily um, the best thing to do. You want to kind of taper the whole ax, uh, the top of the ax handle that's going to go up through the eye evenly. And those cheeks will fit down nice and even. And everything else should fit well. So I'll show you guys that process too. All right, so that one's good. That one is good. Back looks good. Okay. That's clean. Do the other cheek just a little bit. Guys, what I did is a little white. Right here, you might be able to see that I went all the way around and added just kind of ground down that inner edge all the way around so fit really nicely onto the handle. All right, so like I showed before, I do have about two inches of of uh, penetration right now, which is good to start with. It's already fitting in. It's sitting nice and straight. So the blade is going straight down the handle. Now this handle has just a little bit of a warp in it, but it's okay. Okay, so now I'm gonna start removing a little bit of material from the head. Now, um, this handle is already mostly shaped down to the right eye, so I don't really need to use a lot of material. I'm, at this point, it's pretty much ready just for rasps. And I'm actually gonna use a new rasp today. So this, uh, this showed up in the mail. Came from Amazon and shipped directly to my house. I wasn't exactly sure where it came from. It was just slightly weirded out by someone knowing my address and sending something in the mail to me because my wife didn't buy it for me, my brother didn't. My family didn't, as far as I knew. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, cool. I, you know, I really enjoy, um, I've, I've used a Shinto rasp one time. Um, and that was a buddy of mine in college had one and it worked well. And I thought since then that it'd be a really nice addition to my tools, but I just haven't gotten one. So um, a couple days later, my uncle reached out to me and asked me if I had received the rasp that they had sent. He really liked it. So 
was some creeper, someone who found out my address was actually my uncle, which was fine. Uh, and it's been here in the shop ready to be used for two grits. So we have like a, a coarse teeth on one side and fine on the other side. It looks like it's made out of, you know, something together. together so spear, which I'll use. I also have a four in one or four in hand. So this is a rasp, half round and then flat. So it has four tools in one, which is really nice. But I'm gonna try uh, the Shinto rasp. Let's start off. So I'm starting off with just the back of the eye right now. I knew there was a little bit of that, had to come down some more. Just cleaning that up, because it's a little rough. Yeah, this is cutting really nicely. My only, the one thing I like more about the half round is that you actually have a round, um, you know, a round file, round rasp that can get into the inside of a curve. I like. Clean this up just a little bit, even it out. Do a little bit on the sides and I still have the wooden jaws in my vise to clamp onto this handle. So I'm just making sure when I clamp the handle that I'm clamping on a spot that's the level perpendicular and the two sides are perpendicular that way I'm not stretching or warping the handle. Clean up the sides a little bit just enough to see where we are. So this has got to be a little bit more on the sides. This is a, again, a vintage handle that I pulled off another ax a while back. And it's really nice. Uh, there was not a wedge in it when I got it, which is also nice because it means I didn't have to pull a wedge out and have to drill in and take material off. It's already, it was ready. I just, I think it had maybe a little metal wedge or something in it, which I just pulled out. Up. And it's had plenty of material, maybe about an inch and a quarter or so material that I could set this axe head down further onto the shoulders of the handle. So that was good. All right, so now I need to use my half round to get into the back of the eye a little bit. So I'm working that out. <laughs> There we go. So Jack Tuttle was my uncle who sent this to me. So I don't know if you heard Uncle Jack, but I was just telling the story of how it showed up in the mail. And I wasn't sure who sent it. And a little bit weirded out that someone had gotten my address. <laughs> Come to find out it was from you guys, which I, today's my first time. I just opened it up and I'm excited. It seems like it cuts really well so far. All right. All right. So. Now I have uh, the bottom of this. I'm just gonna work, let's see. Give it a little tap. So I've got about maybe half an inch maybe or so inside the head. Um, so I just gained, you know, I gained another inch or so just by cleaning that up, smoothing that out and probably also by chamfering the bottom of that eye, it just let it go down a little deeper. So it looks like it's pretty nice fit so far at the bottom. I'm going to start removing a little bit more off the back and keep it going down. Um, it looks like also it's tilted down a little, so it's a little closed. So I wanna bring that up because I want the top of the head to be parallel or perpendicular to the floor. So we'll bring this down a little bit more, which will bring the back down and it'll open it just a little bit. Let's see if I can tap that off. Now I have a couple different drifts that I keep, usually right near my bench, different sizes. Um, this is an old maybe hammer handle that I've ground down to kind of narrow, but still flat. I use this to drift out wood. I also have a railroad spike that I ground flat, which use, that works well too when something's a little tighter. And now this is obviously gonna be not super tight in because I didn't set it home that tart, but Something soft, it's not gonna damage the top of your eye. Take that out. All right. So just work a little bit more on the back. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> 
go watch Buck and Billy Ray. I absolutely do love Buck and Billy Ray. That guy is, um, I don't know. He, like, I, I like the content because I'm an axe guy and I like axes and, you know, chainsaws and things are all fun. Just the power and the, you know, the energy. He's got tons of energy, but he is just such, he's so full of, like, love and generosity and well-being and all and just... I mean, it's contagious. I can't help but smile when I watch his channel. It's just really nice to see someone who's like so loving and so, you know, helpful and um, just, I don't know, he seems like a good dad, seems like a good husband. Just a really cool channel to watch. And he's doing a really good job. He's, you know, his channel is blowing up or, you know, it's going really well for him. So I'm happy for him. And it's really fun to watch. I like his content. So that's always good. I have wood, just uh, wood jaws in my vise right now. Um, I haven't made any leather jaws just because I was having the wood works fine. Um, these are ones that I made just with a couple pieces of of uh, hardwood, um, and then I took two pieces of masonite and kind of just hammer them on top and so it's just enough weight to keep them on from falling off and then i you know i'll add tape on and off occasionally just if i'm doing different stuff if i want to keep something clean but it's just enough weight to hold them in place just light enough that it falls off and annoys me pretty often um one of the things i've thought about doing is putting little magnets underneath here so then it, it's actually magnetized which would be nice but you know, just another thing to do. It works okay. Works well. They stay in the they stay in my vise all the time. I rarely do I actually clamp something in the vise without using those jaws because why not? All right, let's give this another shot. Oh, actually, before I do that, I need to make a flat that I can hammer on. Now this handle has a bit of a chip out of it here, and it's pretty steep. So I want to flatten this maybe about an inch or so. I might actually cut down, not all the way to the end of this, bottom of this uh, chip out, but I am gonna, cause it's chipping out here too, so I don't wanna hammer too much on this. It's gonna break it all off. So I'm actually gonna use it on the bandsaw real quick and we'll cut off just about, you know, enough that I have about a flat, an inch or so of flat there. Here, make a quick mark. Something like here, and I want to. I'll. I like to have a little bit more rounded um, palm swell anyway. So my plan was to cut that off and round it, which is nice. You know, then you actually have more of a flat to uh, to hammer on when you're hanging your head. <clears throat> okay. So just a quick mark, just so I have something to reference off of to keep it straight. Let's go. So it gives me a nice flat spot, and I'll let me grind a little bit real quick. Plug in. Plug you in. And that and there, and there, and something's got to go. The video is buffering pretty bad. Just like mm. the Wi-Fi or anything. All right. Uh, yeah. Somebody mentioned that it's buffering kind of bad. We're on a phone in my basement. It's not the greatest Wi-Fi. Um, so, uh, sorry, it's not Wi-Fi. It's just on the phone. My nephew Gabriel said, hello. Hello, Gabriel. How's it going? Hanging out with Pop. Chainsaw file. Dustin Chavers said chainsaw file. Yes, I was using a chainsaw file. Aha. All right, so I'm just gonna quickly just grind just a quick chamfer on that so that way again when I'm hitting on here it doesn't want to chip out.
Okay. So don't kill me for not putting them on my respirator. I did put on my eye protection. Just a real quick grind, real quick cut, just enough to have a flat spot. Now, now I can hammer on and be able to seat this head. Give it another try. Looks like it's starting to be pretty nice. I want to go that way a little bit. So I'm not hammering it too much. Uh, we probably gained about a quarter of an inch now, so we're closer to the top. Getting close. Nice and full all the way. The cheeks are touching down, which is nice, all the way to the back. So everything seems pretty clean right now. So now that I'm starting to make some progress down the handle, what I'll do the next time I hang it is I'll put a little bit of pencil on the inside of the bottom of the eye. So that way when I hammer it down in, I'll be able to see really clearly where that is. Now, it also will show up just by compression on the wood, we'll see. Um, we'll be able to see where the handle went down on, but it just adds, it makes it a little bit easier. And we can really see where it's pressing, where it's touching. <clears throat> All right, so we just need to take a little bit more off both sides and the back. Let's do this. Let's... All right. Is that a Harbor Freight dead blow hammer? It is a Harbor Freight dead blow hammer. Got good eye. Uh, yep, this is a three pounder, three pound dead blow. It's great, a great hammer to have. Works really nice um, because it is rubber or plastic, you know, whatever. Whew, smells like China. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just uh, definitely a good hammer to have. It's soft faces, but the dead blow is nice. It gives you that no spring. So the nice thing about a dead blow hammer, it has like a um, shot inside of it, lead shot or steel shot, which gives it some weight. And there's just enough inside there that when you hammer, you swing it and the shot's back here. When it hits, the shot after the hit, the shot follows the, the weight down to the bottom. So instead of it going boing and bouncing, it stops because the shot follows up behind it and keeps it from popping. It's just a nice heavy hammer too and it's nice and soft on the back of this so I don't damage the end of the handle. All right, so we are getting closer. Just doing a little bit on the sides. Now, one thing that I like to do when I'm working on a vintage handle that I don't want to ruin the patina is that I will um, obviously we have to remove some material from the eye or from the handle and that's taking off that patina. It's going back to that clean raw wood. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of taper that out. I'll flare it so it's not just a harsh cut mark. So I'll try to sand it and get it to kind of flare down just a little bit so I get almost like a sunburst um, where once I re-oil this it'll have a nice kind of a nice uh, gradation on color and i'll show you that on another handle let's see uh this one doo -doo 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 -doo. Boop, 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 boom. no not that one uh, well this one had it this is one i did recently in a video this is the collins legitimus i mentioned it as well so here you can see there's this nice patina on the handle and I just kind of worked that grind, those, uh, you know, the grinding and the sanding down some. So it didn't just have like a stark stop, it actually transitions down to the handle. So you kind of a fade in, it looks nicer. And this will just, you know, continually age and get darker over time. So that's what I'm gonna do today as well. So I'm working this down a little bit. I do, man, this is really nice. It has the, uh, I really like the, the rough and the fine sides of this rasp. It kind of does the same thing that the foreign one does. It's just missing that uh, rounded side, which I like. But this is nice having two different uh, textures, one rough and one smooth to be able to really uh, take your time, do some heavy removal with the one side and then clean up those lines and a little bit 
just softer, gentler removal with the other. Back a little bit more. hammer for 20 seconds. <laughs> so I mentioned in my last live stream that I've really enjoyed doing live streams and uh, it's been really nice seeing a lot of makers and a lot of content creators doing live streams as well. Everyone's kind of, you know, stuck by themselves and especially channels that have you know, crews of people who are all working together to produce your channel, like we have, my brother and I are very close by and, you know, we are still getting together to keep our essential, just enough of our business going. <laughs> uh, but, you know, a lot of people have bigger crews and things, those bigger channels, and they just don't, they can't get together and can't film. So because of that, and depending on where you are in the country and where you are in the world, uh, because of that, a lot of people are doing live streams because it's something you can do on your own. You don't need any production. You just start the live stream. You film. You talk. You do whatever you're going to do. You end it, and then it uploads. So it's really an easy way to put more content out there for you guys. Whoop. Ooh, how you like that? Nice. Caught my belt right behind my back. <laughs> okay. Ah, ah, I got it again. <laughs> You do not want to stay up there. There. Okay, let's see how that looks. We're getting close. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. My brother reminded me to put a little bit of a pencil in the bottom. So I'm just taking my pencil and just, you know, drawing a little bit on that chamfer that I made all the way around. And that will give me a clear evidence of what's touching the sides of the ax handle as I put it down, which is really nice because then it shows me where I need to remove more material from. So easy trick. Okay, put that on. That's seated just a little bit. All right, and let's give it a couple blows. Now I don't want to do too much now because it. I don't need to really smash it on there at this point. I just need to know where I'm touching and it is still closed a bit. So I need to work the back a little bit more. So I take a little bit more here. We are just reaching the top of the eye. So it's come down another quarter of an inch. Like I said, I could, if I really gave it a few really heavy blows, I'm sure I could get it to sink down further, but I don't need to right now. Just need to see where we're touching so we can remove more material. All right. Oh, it looks like just a little teeny bit showed up. Not much. Maybe I put it on too much of the chamfer. Let me add a little bit more to it and give it one more shot. So I'm gonna go on the inside a little bit more. I did get just a little bit, which maybe it just means we're just getting a nice even, you know, fit all the way around, but that should show up more. So let's see what we can do. And the other thing you can do is you can just, I mean, if you wanna see how far you're fitting on, uh, actually, I did see one thing. No, it's fine. Okay, let's give it one more shot. I was going to say, I, I kind of saw it biting in the front a little bit. Okay, so that's where it was hitting there. So I did go down. Let's bring this down a little bit. A couple blows. Okay. Right there. I saw that. And that. All right. Pop it back out. 
Now, the more time you spend hanging axes, the less amount of times you'll need to put your handle back in and back out. And um, I mean, when I start, first started hanging axes, you know, I'd, I'd put my handle in and out 50, 60, 70 times. All right, so here you can see there's a lot of compression. So all this is where the compression is happening. This is all down to here. There's pencil marks there. Obviously it's not touching here, not much right here, a little bit in the front here, just a little bit here. This is what I want to make sure I want to remove that by taking more material off of here. It'll tilt the head up and seat it down more. So we're getting tight fit all the way, which is nice, but I want to smooth this area out. I don't want to just remove material just from that area. I want to gent, you know, gently taper it up. So I'm going to take a little material off the sides first. The Shinto rasp. Clean up where it's pressing and go a little further. So that way I'm not just taking off that little lip. I'm actually removing more material so it can slide down further. Around a little bit of around it there as well. There. Okay, flip it over to the same thing on the other side, a little bit off the back, clean up the front just a little bit, and then we'll try again. If you want to see a Another guy who's really good at hanging axes. You guys should check out Vintage Axe Works on Instagram. Um, his whole business is rehanging vintage axe heads and reselling them. Does really beautiful work. He also um, makes all of his handles from scratch. And I'm sure he does also like vintage restoration as well. But um, usually what you'll see on his channel a lot of him, his channel is on Instagram, a lot of him uh, making and making handles, fitting heads. So he does really beautiful work with a uh, draw knife and most of it that is really nice. Also Liam Hoffman, another great axe handler. He does some, has some really nice videos as well online on how to hang uh, axes, which I've learned from and use tips and tricks that he does. Den creation, so just started my channel. No videos yet, but getting some ideas from yours. Any advice? Um, advice for starting a new channel. Uh, I would say do a lot of... Be consistent. So try to put out consistent videos. So if you, I can say from experience that when we really kind of buckled down and kind of made the decision to put out videos consistently, you know, we really were aiming for like once a week for a while, which we did for a little bit. You know, that's kind of hard to keep up, but you know, with both of us having full-time jobs, um, but yeah, just being consistent, even if it's, you know, one every two weeks, one every three weeks, once a month, as long as you're consistent, especially in the beginning and put out, you know, more and more content, that will really help. Um, and it'll start to build up your viewership quicker when people see that stuff happening and, you know, they subscribe. And then if you don't have any videos that pop up in their feed for a while, they'll kind of forget about you. But if you stay consistent, also uh, another thing is, you know, start a Instagram for your channel and stay consistent there. So, you know, like our channel, we, you know, we obviously can only put out so much material, so much content. Um, so I really uh, try to put a lot of material out on Instagram. Just try to keep up, keep you guys up to date on what I'm working on in the shop. And that just helps to build that community, build that consistency. Um, also, I don't know, try to try to differentiate, dif differentiate yourself a little bit. Try to do something a little different. That was kind of our goal when we started was to just put a little bit more time and effort into the production quality of our channel. With my brother's background in uh, video and film, 
he had the knowledge and the eye for that, you know, more cinematic look, production quality that we were going for. And I think that helped to distinguish us a little bit. So, you know, and, you know, be passionate about what you're doing. Try to do something that you really enjoy that comes across in the videos. Let's see what we got. 19 likes out of 80-ish people. A few more likes. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Well, dang, 78 people watching. That is good. That's pretty good. Usually we're right around the 50 to 60 mark, so... 78, 79 people? Maybe we can become more consistent with these. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So, we should also be more consistent with our live streams. Try to do something a little more consistently for you guys, which we like doing. I'm using a bigger round, half round rasp. I, just need, I knew I needed to take a little bit more off this time. So, went to my more aggressive one. Take a little bit more off, bigger chunk. Now the problem with that is sometimes you get a little bit too overzealous and then take off too much and then I sink the head down too far and then there's no going back. But this one kept biting into the back so I knew that I needed to take a little bit more off than I had been. Move this process along a little bit quicker. Crafting a life I want says E says hi. Oh. Crafting a life I want. What's up, buddy? What's up, E? My little best friend. My buddy Sean, that's his son, E. He's been... It's been tough not being able to get together with our friends. And... He's one of the ones that I miss a lot. He and I became really close when our friends moved back to Baltimore. It's been really nice being able to be with him while he grows up and have a really nice relationship with him. do have an art degree. I went to Maryland Institute College of Art for my undergrad, and then I went to University of New Hampshire for grad school. I got my master's in fine art in painting. Um, and for me, the decision to go back to school to get my master's degree was because I wanted to teach. Um, and I, you know, I felt that getting my master's degree and getting that additional education would really help, Whoop. would, um, would kind of give me a leg up in that when looking for teaching jobs. All right, we're getting pretty close. Got about, you know, half an inch or so above the eye now. Still want to bring this up a little bit, so I think I'm still going to take a little bit more down off of here, but I don't want to do too much. This will bring it down, I'm getting a nice fit up on both sides on the cheeks that are coming down, nice and tight. Just a little bit of gap, but I think that's mostly just from the chamfer. So when I you know, do my final drive home, I'll really be able to seat that down nice and tight on there uh, and get a wedge in there, which we'll do shortly. But I think I'll maybe one or two more passes and that should be good. The blade is still straight down the handle is great that means i'm not taking too much off of one side or the, the other so as it's going down it's staying straight up and down if i take too much off of one side you'll start to get some twist which is you know it's the same way you can actually remove twist from the head is by if it's twisting one way you take a little bit more material off the other side so if it were tipping you know to my left your guys right if it's tipping this way that means there's too much material removed from that side so you can take some off the other side and it'll bring it back so it'll let that cheek sit down more on that side so if you're getting that where and get to the point where your handles or your axe heads are not running straight down your handle, then it's because you're taking too much material off of one side or the other. Mark Gonzalez. Hello, Mark. Thank you so much, buddy. 
He says he loves the channel. We love the subscribers and the viewers. Hello from Northern Michigan and hi, oh, hi E from Ireland. Hear that E? Yeah, somebody from Ireland saying hi to you. So again, that's my buddy Sean. He has a YouTube channel called Crafting a Life I Want. You guys should go check it out. Man, I keep dropping that handle. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you, Jack, for it said a while ago. It's all about problem solving. Aha. There you go. I just mentioned Vintage Axe Works. Uh, yeah, and like that's what someone said earlier on the live stream was, you know, are you worried about making mistakes and things um, while you're live streaming? And, you know, making is about problem solving. So you're doing something and you know, say if I'm, you know, trying to put a joint in, um, you know, to put two pieces of wood together, it's what's the best way for those to fit? What exact measurements do I need? You know, I have this joint that's here and this joint. I need a mortise and tenon. I want my mortise to be this size because it needs to be this strong. So then my tenon needs to be this size. So then you got to figure it out. It's all about figuring out as you go. Obviously, there's a process you want to follow, but, you know, sometimes it's just about figuring out what you need to do to solve that problem. All right. So we're getting a good bite there. A little bit less there. Take a little bit more off the back. Just take a little bit off the sides. I'm kind of doing a general all over pass, but a little bit mostly just off of the back because I want that back of that head to sit down a little further. Straighten up the top of the bit, top of the axe head. I still have a lot of material, which is nice. So even if I get this seated all the way down, it looks really good. It'll still give me a little bit of um, handle material to seat it further in the future. If it comes loose or, you know, I'm, I'm in a pretty uh, moist climate here. So the difference between winter and summer, you know, we have a lot of humidity in Maryland. So it's really humid and moist air in the summer. And then the winter is pretty dry. So all of my, my tools become loose and, you know, get tight again. So I have to, you know, I'm always kind of doing maintenance on them. So by giving myself, by seating this ax down on this handle, but not all the way down to the widest part, it'll give me the opportunity to seat it down more later. Just a little bit of a tap and go it's coming back a little bit i think some of it's just the shape of this head is kind of wide up here i don't need it to be so far back usually when you put your axe on a flat surface and i can't really show you guys let's see if i can show you here so there's a few different ways that you could tell if your axe Uh, grab a piece of something that's longer that I can show this on. Maybe that, is that longer? No. Here, there you go. That'll work. All right. So when you put your bit down on a table where the handle touches, you usually want your bit, so the cutting edge, it should be sitting about right in the middle of that cutting edge. Now, this is just a smidge low. So I'm on just below halfway. So it's touching about here instead of in the middle, which means that I need to bring that ax head back some, tip it back some so that it'll straighten it up and I'll get it to rest more right in the middle. Now this is pretty close. It's not, not bad, but actually that means it needs to go forward more. Oh, right. So I'm actually probably Okay, it might also determine on how much your handle is resting, but it's actually not bad. Yeah, with the way it's going, it's actually telling me that I need to tip it further forward, but I don't want to go too much for, for, further forward because then it's just going to look kind of funky. So I think this is looking really nice. We're pretty solid. So 
At this point, I want to, I'm gonna remove this one more time. I'm gonna work on the kerf a little bit and widen it because right now it's pressing really tight and the kerf is all the way closed. So I wanna kind of widen that kerf just a little bit so that way when I do put my wedge in, I'll have a little bit of a space there. So we'll go ahead and pop this off, widen the kerf, work on a wedge and send it home. How are we doing on time? 74 minutes, not bad. Could be his bandwidth. Oh yeah, sorry guys. Um, we are filming on a cell phone. It's not the greatest. No Wi-Fi, just internet. Something I'm working on. Um, where I am out in the county here in Baltimore, I can't get internet at my house. Now I can't get like Comcast or wired internet. I might be able to get um, satellite TV, which I can get some type of off-brand internet along with that. So I'm working on it. <laughs> nice. Mark Gonzalez says he built the two by 72 by housework after seeing your unboxing. Awesome. Yeah, man, that it's such a cool grinder. I really appreciate you guys supporting him. Brian is an awesome dude and, um, his grinder is really cool. All right. So a little bit, I'm just gonna take a little teeny bit more off of this in preparation to seed it all the way. Just wanna take this a little bit of a, a little bit of a shelf I'm seeing, a little bit of, you know, where it's kind of squeezing in, but I am getting nice contact pretty much all the way around. All right. Blend that out a little bit, like I mentioned earlier. So it looks nice later when I oil it up. I don't want all my grind lines to just stop. I'll hit that with some sandpaper a little later. Okay, so now, on that, we're gonna cut the kerf a little wider. And I'm just gonna use a Japanese pool saw. Just take it right down the existing kerf. It's been smashed really tight um, from being out of the ax head. So uh, I'll just be able to cut right along it and should open it up a little bit, which would be nice. I just put my fingers, my fingernails, right where I want the saw blade to cut. Uh, it's just resting against my fingernails. It's not underneath of them. It's, you know, they just help to keep the blade running straight where I want it to in two spots, the front and the back of the head. Started just a little bit. See how it's going, double check it. Do a little bit more. Double check it's right where I want it to, front and the back. Looks like it is. Obviously, it wants to follow along that existing kerf, but. Any you guys been watching Alex Steele's live streams? It's cool to see him back. I kind of a cool story about that. When we first started our channel, uh, yeah, maybe not very first started it, but maybe six months in, eight months into starting our channel, we were still, you know, just a couple thousand subscribers, maybe. Um, I was watching one of his live streams and this was when he was still back in his Baker Street uh, workshop, if you guys remember that, before he moved to his larger shop and before he moved to the US, which now he's in Montana. I don't know if you guys can hear me while I'm sawing, hopefully. <laughs> uh, it keeps on, we'll need these skills. Yeah, back to basics. Um, but yeah, he's been doing some live streams. So when he was at his Baker Street studio, Baker Street um, shop, uh, he was doing a live stream with his buddy Sam. And I don't remember what they were working on, but they were working on something. And I logged in, I was watching the live stream and I mentioned something to him and, you know, and he said my name and called me out and mentioned it. And that was like, whoa, it's crazy. And this was back, he might've had at the time I don't even remember if he had over 100,000 subscribers. So he's still pretty early on, but uh, maybe he did. But it was just cool seeing somebody on, you know, on YouTube that I respected and I liked what he was doing. Um, and, you know, he called me out. He shouted me out on his channel, which was pretty exciting. So I do my best to kind of see you guys out there and appreciate you guys watching and, and talk to you a little bit because, you know, one of the things that also annoys me that, not really annoys me, I understand it, but you know, there are a lot of people 
when they're talking. Now, someone like Alex Steele, you know, he might have, at this point, he's going to have thousands of people watching his live streams. So obviously, he can't, can't like talk to everybody. He can't mention everybody's names. But he will, you know, call out the people who do the super chats. And that's cool. You know, I think that's important. Obviously, if someone's giving you some money, you know, they deserve a little bit of a shout out. But I also think that the rest of us like shout outs. You know, we all want to be acknowledged and we all, you know, we're all community and it's important that we're all, you know, loving and caring about each other and all hanging out and talking. So I do appreciate everybody joining and I want to do my best to kind of stay up with your comments and chat, which is why it's nice to have my brother behind the camera. If he sees questions and things come up, he'll relay them to me while I'm doing some other stuff, which is also why I like to have a little bit of the, um, you know, sometimes it's just to sit down and chat, just answer your questions, hang out, read the comments. You know, it doesn't always have to be making something, but it is nice to have, you know, something to do while I'm, while I am talking to you guys. And, you know, it creates, I would a little bit more interesting content for you, especially for the channel and something that'll be up on the channel. Now this is going really well. I'm actually cutting a decent amount of material out of this kerf, which is good. Um, opening it up should be really nice. And someone mentioned earlier about cutting your kerf uh, before you hang the head. And I suggested waiting if you can, if you're using a handle or like that doesn't have a kerf cut into it, wait till you fit your head mostly before you widen the kerf or cut the kerf because then you have, you're not smashing that kerf shut and then having to widen it later. You're fitting everything where it's nice and tight. And obviously once you put it back in, things are going to, uh, they're gonna close up because where you were fitting nice and tight is now gonna be some spots where it's gonna squeeze that kerf shut. Um, that's one of the things that Buck and Billy Ray does that someone mentioned earlier is that he uses a, um, a hacksaw blade and he'll kind of put it down inside once he has it on the on the head, once he has the head on the ax handle. I'm always like surprised that he can keep his curves that open, which, you know, makes a big difference. If you're able to have your curve open, then it'll accept a lot more wedge, which is the whole point. Ooh. All right. There we go. All right, so now I was able to clean that out, and work my way down. And you know, every time I bring this along, it's kind of cleaning out that kerf and just opening it up just a little bit more, <coughs> which is what I want to do. All right, let's see what we got. Beaver Tooth Handle Company, absolutely. Um, all good companies that are doing really good quality handles. Uh, house, um, house handles are really good. Beaver Tooth are, are, are good. I mean, I haven't, um, let's see. I've used house handles. Uh, Whiskey River Trading Company, Brandon Roos, he does really nice stuff. I've used some of his. I've never actually used a beaver tooth, but I've seen them used a few times and I've seen people who I respect recommend them. So it's one of those things where, and there's a few companies that are making them, making handles primarily just for making handles. So you can go to, you know, a hardware store and pick up a handle, but it's gonna be pretty chunky. And a lot of times the grain's gonna be pretty crappy. This is a, uh, let's see. Ames company handle. So I'll go through and I'll kind of select ones. This actually has pretty decent grain. Um, you might be able to see it. You know, it's all running parallel with the handle. Good grain which is the reason why I picked it up. But they're really chunky. I mean, if you look at this compared to this, you know, this is almost half of the width. Maybe not all the way, but you just see how much. Now, the nice thing about that is that it gives you plenty of material to shape your handle to whatever you want it to be gives a really like a giant palm swell at the end. Again, you know, it gives, it's, my point of view is that it just gives you plenty of material to do what you want with it, which is kind of nice. But there are really good companies like Beaver Tooth and Whiskey River House um, that are doing really good quality handles. Um, 
Chris Killinger makes really nice handles or, or, you know, distributes really nice handles as well. All sorts of, you know, with kind of this revitalization of people using hand tools and axes and things. There are quite a few companies out there now, not quite a few, but there are a few companies out there now that are putting out really good quality um, handle material. All right, so let's see. Now, got the curve cut. Axe head's good, we're happy with that. Let's see what else. So now we need to do a wedge. Hey, 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 we got a busier in the shop. My dad's here, hey dad, how's it going? Good to see you. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, so I need to cut a wedge. I have a piece of, this is a piece of cherry, which would be enough, but I think I'm gonna, let's see, let's see. So this is two and five eighths, my curve right now is about two and three quarters. So I think I want to go a little deeper. All right, let's see. Grab my, grab a wedge from my stash or grab a piece of wood like that. Uh, that, and that, and that. Let's go. Bingo, I want to do that. Let me pull this over and take a look. Okay. Be boobinga. Okay. Oh, a piece of black walnut. That's what I want. Let's see. Mahogany. Cody. Where's that black walnut? Actually, what's this? This. I think that's what we're going to use. This is actually a piece of Epe, which is a nice hardwood. And oh, that actually might not be wide enough. Okay, not wide enough. All right. Blah, 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 blah. This and this and that and that. And what do we got here? What do we got? What do we got? Maybe it's down here. We got some hickory. Okay, I think I'm gonna go with what's that? That's hickory. Sorry guys. I thought I had one that was gonna work earlier, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted. And that, and that's really wide. That's pretty, but a little wider than I want. And there we go. This, okay, we'll use this. This is good. This is a piece of Bubinga, which is just the right size, small enough. I don't feel like I'm wasting something. So I want to do at least three inches or so. So I'm just going to mark this off at three inches, clean it up a little bit. Let's see, Do -do -do -do. let's go this side, mark it at three, use a square. Like that. And let me go here, clean this up first. There's three inches there, should be plenty. Okay, now I do, I'm gonna go about a little bit more than a quarter. I'm gonna go, let's go this way. Now what I'm doing is I'm just, I'm drawing an angle. So I'm gonna create my wedge. I'm gonna cut this on the bandsaw and I wanna bring this down. I don't wanna go super narrow, but I also don't wanna go super wide and I'll change, I'll do a little changing to this once I get it going. But that's maybe three eighths or so of an inch. I think that's probably good. Nice wedge. That should be a good starting point and I can kind of do a little bit of changing from there down. So that should be good. So we'll trim this up. There we go. Trim this up 
uh, clean up a little bit first on the bandsaw, then trim it tall on the bandsaw, and then on the grinder. Let's do it. Let's see what we got. Splinter's easy. Red oak isn't bad either. Not as good as hickory. Yeah. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Thanks. Red oak does splinter easily. Thank you, Nada Sajuj from Ireland. He's uh, encouraging everybody to like as you go. Thumbs up. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate everybody's support as we work through this live stream. Okay. I'm just uh, reworking this. I'm going to make this line a little darker with my marker. Just see it well, because now I'm going to be cutting this on the bandsaw up and down. So I'm going to make sure I can see it really well. Maybe I'll mark the end of it as well. So let's go here, mark the end so I can ensure that I am uh, I'm cutting it as close to vertical as possible. There. That. At least give myself a, a little bit more of a reference. Okay. So you can see I give myself a reference on the end as well as here on the face. I'll turn over to the bandsaw, go straight in this way and cut that at an angle. Let's do this.
All right. Well, that actually cut really straight. You can see I was taking my time quite a bit now. Babinga is really hard. So there's three things. Babinga is really hard. So I tried taking my time. Also, I wanted to keep that wedge really clean um, and running straight up and down, which I was taking my time on as well. And honestly, my bandsaw blade probably it's time for it to get changed. It's sharp enough, but you know, probably should have, you know, probably should have changed that. But the nice thing is that the you can tell that this, you know, the bandsaw kerf ran really straight because it came out straight across. So you know that it had to have been running straight up and down pretty much the whole way to be able to come out almost exactly straight where I wanted to come. You can see my pencil line here came out just a little bit past it, which is great because then it just gives me some room to sand down because I want to sand this side down. Johnny G says, can you show the grain directly away? Yes. So, uh, let's see. Boom, 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 boom. Hold on. Let's see if you can shows up a little bit better in some of these other angles. Now, this, I run this way. Let me sand it just a little bit. So here you can see um, th this grain's actually running, whoop, it's actually with the wedge. Now, depending on what type of wood you're using, if you're using a soft wood, um, like a poplar, um, it's better to go the opposite way. It just you know, holds it up a little bit more. Now, I'm using a hard wedge. Um, hard wood, this bingo is really hard wood, so it's not going to compress very much. So, you know, usually you would want your grain to go the opposite direction just because of compression. Um, this has a really tight grain, so it is running this way, but it's very tight. It's not a lot of, you know, a lot of hardwood sapwood or, you know, early wood and late wood back and forth. So it's a really tight grain, hardwood wedge, so it's not as important. But normally I would try to go the opposite direction. All right, so I'm going to grind this a little bit. I want to flatten this surface here. Clean up the bottom, and then uh, and then we'll work on fitting it into the eye.
So here's my wedge. So I'm at, <clears throat> let's see, we're more than thick enough. What do we got? Doo -doo 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 -doo. We've got three and a quarter inches across the top. We have just over three inches, maybe three and an eight, three and a sixteenth deep. So that should be plenty. It's obviously wider than the eye now. So we're going to go ahead and measure the eye, which we have. Now, an axe eye should be tapered, so it should be wider at the top than it is at the bottom, both width and the length of the blade. So let's double check that. So this is two and a half inches across the top. And we've got two and three eighths inches at the bottom. So about an eighth of an inch narrower or like less wide here. And then at the top we have at the widest, we're at, what do we got? Eight, nine, eight, 13 tenths. And at the bottom we have, looks like it's 11 sixteenths maybe. So just a little bit narrow at the bottom. Uh, and you want that, you know, you want an hourglass shape inside your ax. So technically, really you want it to be wide to get narrower in the middle and then wider at the top. That's why when you, if you see videos of people um, drifting ax eyes with, you know, with drifts and things, they'll put a drift in the top, they'll hammer it down through, they'll flip it over, they'll do it from the bottom and they'll hammer it. That way you're actually opening up the bottom and opening up the top, but in the middle it's the narrowest. And I can see that this is pretty much straight in. It's definitely narrower this way than it is. We've got, like I said, about an eighth of an inch. So as it goes up, it's going to be able to fl flush out this way. I'll get the wedge in and then it kind of opens up the bottom, a little bit of an hourglass shape, which should make it fit really nicely into the handle. So let's see again. Once again, we said we are two and a, my ruler go. Here we go. All right, so two and a half. I'm gonna go a little bit wider than two and a half because I wanna make sure it can go in and it can splay out. Um, again, right now I have a little bit more than three. So we'll mark this. I'm gonna mark a center point. So I'm going to mark this down to three first and then I'll mark one and a half inches in the middle and there. So I'm just going to use the grinder. I'll kind of grind that little last bit off and then start to shape it down and we'll test fit it into the axe head as we go. in California and Maine. I'm sure it's about the same up in Maine. Do, 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 do. No belt center of any kind. Always, always buy a belt dressing tool. Ah, uh, yes. Back to basics. Bushcraft. This is a belt dressing tool. It's like a giant rubber eraser and it works really well for cleaning up your belts, getting all the, all the kind of ground in wood or metal in your belt so it cleans it off really nicely. Okay.
Hello from France. Grizzly du Nord, du Nord. Bonjour, Grizzly. 16 is low. What do we got? 93 watching now. Well, that's pretty good. Nice. Watching California, hotter than a mofo out here. Okay. So you can see I kind of showed you guys I have my arrow where it's way I wanted my uh, wedge to go. So the front is going to be a little narrower, the back's a little wider. So I have this in pretty nicely in there. And that takes me down, you know, almost three quarters of the way down the eye. Now, I'm not going to be able to get all that amount of wedge in there, but I want to make sure I have plenty of wood to go down nice and deep. All right. Thank you very much. Back to basics. Johnny G's DIY. Johnny, we're almost done. I'm going to set this wedge and we'll be good to go. But I appreciate you stopping by and hanging out. You got to go. You got to go. All right. So now let's go ahead and oh, let's do a little test. So that's going there. That's good. Okay, I might I want to go too narrow. I might narrow this wedge just a little bit because it's not going to compress at all. So I might just hit it a little bit more on the grinder, narrow it just a little bit, and then we'll be able to set it home. Our wedge is good. I narrowed it down probably about an eighth of an inch or so. So I probably went from, right now I'm at just about three eighths of an inch. It was probably about a half an inch. So I took an eighth down a little bit from both sides, narrowed it down. Again, that was because as I'm putting this inside the eye, I'm thinking like, I'm probably not gonna get that much wedge out of it. So I wanna make sure I get as much as possible and I want the wedge to fill up the eye as much as possible. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and fit the handle to the head for the last time. Give it one more fitting and should fit down as far as we want to go. Okay, just seat it a little bit. There we go. I'm going to give it a couple good whacks with my three pound dead blow. I can feel it seating down really nicely. So at a certain point, it'll it'll sink in and then you can you can hear it and you can feel it. Now, you can't hear it as well with a dead blow, but I can feel it one more time. I can feel it in the handle. You know, when it's sinking down in, it's moving. And then as soon as it's really tight on there, when I hit it, I can really feel that, you know, the compression of it coming back up from the head back up into my handle because it's not moving. So I feel it hitting there. So this is really good. Seated down nice and far. I have plenty of room to fit my wedge in, which is nice. I was able to open up that kerf some more, so it's still room there. I can see light there, which is great. And I have, right now, I've about, let's say I got about three quarters of an inch. So just under, what's it like, uh, one and three quarters centimeters. 
and we've got about three quarters of an inch on this side and a little bit less on the other side. Now I do like to have some material hanging out of the top of the head, but I don't want that much. Uh, and I don't want that much before I put my wedge in because then if I do get my wedge all the way to the bottom, I mean, that's probably as deep as I want to go, but I'm going to cut off about a quarter of an inch or so off the top of this. I'll just mark a little bit. Um, just trim this off so that way I have a little bit less and I can set the wedge in. And then once the wedge is in, then I can cut off that little bit more. That. I'm just going to trim this off real quick on the bandsaw. All right, now we're still flat um, and you know perpendicular to the handle, but now it's a little bit less. So open this up just a smidge. I should use my ruler because that is nice and thin. There we go. And let's see, this is a little bit thicker. Oh, perfect. Okay, so I just cleaned that up, opened up a little bit so I could see my kerf. So now I'm ready to put my wedge in. Got a nice fit up all the way around. Uh, no gaps. You can see there's, you know, it looks like a gap all the way around, but that's because I have my a little bit of the kerf that I put in the chamfer nice and tight all the way down the cheeks. Clean all the way around, no gaps on the bottom. So now I'm going to set my wedge and I like to use a little bit of tight bond, wood glue. This is a uh, type on two, which is a water resistant, which I like to use just because, you know, I'm going to be out and about and there's moisture and things. So use a little bit of wood. It also helps, I think, to lubricate it and let it slide down into that kerf a little bit easier. Ah, this axe is a council tools, three and a half pound Jersey. Um, I guess a Jersey, I don't know. Usually, like I said earlier, usually a Jersey will have a little bit more of these lugs that hang down. So there's a Jersey. Jerseys have the lugs at the bottom. They're pretty pointy. This one has it. It's they're pointed, but it's kind of rounded a little bit. So a little bit more like a rock away, but that would be a little bit like the lugs would be rounded, but not exactly centered. So I guess it's still kind of a Jersey. All right. So again, I have my arrow facing front. So I want to put that in here. So let's do this. Grab. Grab. I should have grabbed this before I put the glue on my wedge. Let's set that up. Okay, grab a log. Right here. You guys see okay here? Should I back up some? That's good. I'm gonna grab, I have a, a small I beam that works well. It gives me a nice hard surface to rest this on. So I'll be putting my wedge in upside down because I can hammer straight down onto it. But for now, I'll start it like this and let's grab, start with a cross peen or actually a straight. Nah. So we'll go ahead and start the wedge in the front. Like so, get it right in there. And when I was, when I was, uh, grinding this wedge, I, I ground the very edge of it to like a real fine point. Now I, I flattened it first so it was, it was thick, so robust, but then I ground kind of a bevel on it so it had a little bit of bevel. That just helps it to get into that curve. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna use... Get that light back right up. <laughs> funky light in the background. All right, so let me seat this a little bit more. Just getting it started. 
I can tell this is already going to be, it's going to be a struggle to get this wedge to go in. All right. Now I got it started. I'm going to flip the whole thing over, put it on my I beam right in the middle and then I'll strike it from the end. Now I'm actually going to use a wooden mallet. You guys will get a little sneak peek. Those of you who are watching. Jack Tuttle, what general purpose grit belt do you use on your grinder? Um, this is a 36 grit belt that's on it right now. And that's just for fast material removal. Nice big wooden mallet that I just made. Well, I wonder how heavy this is. I never actually checked the weight. Check it real quick while we're here together. That video is going to be coming out in just a couple days. We just finished this up two days ago. That is almost four pounds on the nose. So a nice heavy wooden mallet. The nice thing about wood is that it's generally, it's obviously not generally, it's always softer than metal. <laughs> so it's going to be less damaging to a wooden handle. So I'm just sinking this in. And as I go, I'm going to keep looking at it, see if I'm going in straight. Like I said, I can tell now it's going to be a little bit of a struggle to get this wedge in. It's not a lot of room, but it's definitely filling up. All right, it's looking pretty good. It's not going in very far, but that's okay. I'm getting nice uh, compression, splitting out. So as I'm sinking this in, um, I'm trying to keep pressure flat on this wedge, but as I know I need to move it, um, I'll kind of change it as I go. It's crazy. I can hear the wood cracking and it must be this wood here. It's pushing and squeezing in really tight, it's kind of squeezing out and it's probably compressing this wood here. And it's an older handle. But nice, looking pretty good. Um, if I put too much pressure, like if it's not going in straight, I kind of back it up a little bit so that way it'll it'll go in more. But if you do that too much, it's going to split out your wedge in different spots. So I try to avoid that. Now, ideally this wedge would be going in a little deeper, but it's not, but that's okay. I'll give it a couple more hits. I might actually move this to the floor. All right. It's really nice and squeezing out pretty good. Again, it's not going in super deep, but the glue will hold it in place and the wedge should work really well. I think we might be going as far as we're going to go. Okay. Well, I probably have, I would say, let's see, three inches. So we've got about, it's probably going in about an inch or so. So it's probably the wedge is in about a little bit less than halfway, but it's inside here. Again, the eye flares out at the top a little bit, so it's going to fit that space nicely. Um, it's a nice solid head, so I'm not too worried about it. So that should work really well. The glue will help that wedge stay in place, so it shouldn't back out. Um, and you can see how much wedge I have in here. It's pretty thick. Um, so it's, you know, before that was spaced, there was pretty much none there. So it's really pushing out on this. I might give it just a little bit more to get that mechanical hold, to get that mushrooming on the top. See if I can get maybe one more shot. One or two. This is where you're like, ah, oh, let me give it just one more shot. And you break your handle. OK. 
Okay, one more. All right, that's all we're going. Good. Looks good. Okay. So now I'm gonna go ahead and trim this off. Let me clean it up a little bit first. Wipe off the excess glue. Um, the question earlier by Jack Tuttle was saying, it's kind of a general purpose uh, grit that I put on my um, grinder. This grinder usually has like a 160 or 180 grit on it, which is kind of a good kind of general all around use. It's rough enough to be able to take material off. Um, but I, like I said, I'll switch back and forth between kind of a 36, uh, 60, 80, 180, 160, things like that. That's kind of what stays on there. And then when I'm doing more fine work, I'll put, I have a couple higher grip belts and a couple uh, like polishing belts and finishing belts that I'll put on. So here we're cleaning it off. So I want to trim this down now. So I'm gonna cut off the wedge, but I'm also gonna trim down probably another eighth of an inch or so to leave about a quarter of an inch above the eye. I like to have that, uh, that you know, the rest of the eye sitting proud. And I like about a quarter of an inch or so. So let's just, we're gonna do this by eye. I'll do it about, you guys can see that. About a quarter of an inch. I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it. That's what matters right now. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead over and zip this off on the bandsaw real quick. And at this point, I wanna make sure that I have material. I can kind of grind and clean it up after I do it. I don't wanna make sure it's too tight. Um, and I also wanna make sure it's cutting perpendicular to the top of the ax eye or parallel to the top of the eye. always kind of cool to see the how the wedge is fitting inside nice and tight in there that glue holds it on and there's the of the eye so I'll hit this on the grinder just a little bit clean that up and then uh, then chamfer it and we're done what are we at Ooh, two hours Not bad my plan was to film to live stream for an hour, try to get this done in an hour, but you know, best laid plans. Half from KS. Bates MO, we answered him. Change the angle of the wedge depending on the depth of the cut, yes. The depth of the curve, um, yes. What is the ideal depth of the wedge? So two questions, one was saying, do I change the angle of the wedge depending on the kerf, depending on how deep it is? Yes, usually I'll try to get, it's, I usually change the angle of the wedge depending on the type of wood it is. So it's if a soft wood wedge, it can be a little bit fatter because it's gonna compress. If it's a hardwood wedge, it's not gonna compress the wedge, it's gonna be pushing the ax head out. So I'll change the angle of it depending on the type of wood. Um, ideally, you'd like the ideal depth to get your wedge is, th is two thirds of the way down. So usually you wanna set your kerf about that depth and then you wanna hit the wedge in. Now I got about a little bit less than halfway, so I would have liked to go maybe another half an inch or so, but this is okay. So I'm just gonna clean up the face, flatten it out, hit these edges a little bit. I'll try to chamfer it on the grinder. I should be able to kind of get that as I move around, we'll see. And I'm gonna clean up the end a little bit as well, same time.
So I was just uh, using my grinder to clean up the top of the handle. So I did that, I chamfered all the way around, cleaned it up, ran the grind lines vertically just to get it clean so that way when I oil it, it'll look really nice. Uh, and then I went to the bottom and I rounded over that kind of cut that I put in. I put a flat in so I could hammer it. Now I still have a flat here, which is nice so I can still hammer on this if I need to seat it later, but uh, rounded that a little bit and then chamfered all the way around the edges to get a clean chamfered bottom, which I just think looks really beautiful. Uh, so the last thing I want to do before I oil it is just take some sandpaper real quick, some 220, hit this just a little bit, and then we'll oil it up and we'll be finished. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. It's been a fun day in the shop. I always love, always love to uh, work on axes. And it's fun to bring you guys along, show you some of the tips and tricks and kind of show you the whole process. So that was obviously like using a handle that I already had um, that was pretty much ready to go. Now, it wouldn't have taken me too much longer to, to do this process if it was from a fresh, oh my gosh, why is this? Let's take that off. Uh, like a, a fresh handle would have been about the same amount of time it's just removing the material from the head. I would have worked a little bit quicker if I had to, but. Um, so this is just actually a piece of 240. And I'll just real quickly hit the handle. And that's just kind of clean up the tool marks from the files and the rasps. They're pretty minimal. Let's see, actually let me grab just a little bit rougher. This is, I think, an 80 grit. And then grab a little piece of this 80 grit. Just clean this up a little bit. Now I'm not super particular. I don't mind there being some tool marks because it is a tool, but I like to clean up the bits. I usually do this before I do my final hang, but same difference. I'm just cleaning up from where you can see it underneath and also helping to fade again the um, patina from the original handle, fading it into from, you know, clean new wood into that patinaed wood. So it's not just a stark contrast where I was working today. All right. little bit. Hitting everything real quick just to take off that very top layer of dirt and grime or something that's been on here and it'll just help when I oil this whole handle. It'll help the oil to penetrate everything just a little bit better. Chamfer a little bit so it's not so sharp right on that edge. And my hands can be touching. All right. All right, time to oil it up. So we gotta make some space, make sure I don't get oil all over everything. These are a solid two hours spent in the shop, hanging out with you guys, hanging an ax that I've been wanting to hang for quite a while. Guten Abend, Benjamin. Billy Smith, thank you very much. How do you keep your glasses from fogging up with your mask on? That is a really good question. So I'll tell you guys, I use, uh, these are like old safety glasses. Uh, that don't actually hug my face super tight. Now they do have the protection on the sides um, and nice and you know wide on top and bottom, but they don't hug my face really tight because they would fog up. I have a few different types of safety glasses that I wear. 
Um, these are just like the kind of typical low profile kind. And then there's the bigger kind that do protect a little bit more. Um, and all of these, you know, they hug your face pretty tight. And if something, if they hug your face tight, then that's usually what will make my glasses fog up. Um, so that's one of the things. They don't hug super tight to my face. Now, that's great for keeping them fogged up. You know, the idea of having it hug really tight is that it can protect your eyes really well. Also, when I'm using my respirator, I make sure that I get a good fit on the top of my nose. So that way, when I'm breathing in and out, I'm not actually getting air coming up in between here. That's something you can get that really, a way that I don't really like to wear like dust masks because a lot of that air comes up past my nose and just goes right up and fogs my glasses. <coughs> so I, I prefer to wear the respirator because it fits really nice and tight to the top of my nose and I don't get air coming up through there. So I don't have to worry about it fogging up too much. They will fog up. If I'm really warm, it'll fog up. But actually, as I have everything on, as I kind of, I'll clean them a couple times and then as I kind of cool down and fit, settle in, then they kind of level out. All right, so I'm using boiled linseed oil to oil the handle. And I like to wear gloves when I do it just because for one, I don't like to get my hands all oily, but also that just ensures that all that oil is soaking into the handle and not on my, in my skin. I prefer it being in the handle. I'm gonna put on some gloves. And this is kind of, so whenever I oil a hand, I always end up having too much oil on my hands or on my gloves. So then it comes this, this becomes this like game of, do I need another ax handle that needs a little bit more oil on it? Sure, so I grab one, I put a little oil on it. And then I'm like, well, now, now this one needs a little bit more oil, right? So, and I put a little bit more oil on my hands and oil the glove, oil the handle. And then I have too much oil on my hands. So then I grab another handle and just keep going and going until I kind of level it out and get the right amount of oil on my hands. All right, so I just wear gloves. Dip in a couple fingers, I grab some oil, flip my hand over so it's now it's like in my hand and oil it up. Now some people like to put oil on the handle inside of the eye. Um, and I do see some, you know, sometimes that actually can be pretty, pretty beneficial because it's, you know, it's a dry area that's not going to get a lot of oil on it. Um, but I've done that a couple times and I found that when I do that, I'll get my head slipping back off. It's too, too slippery, too much lubri lubrication on that wood and it just slips off and I can't get it to seat really well. So I don't do that. Um, you'll see ax makers and handlers, people like, uh, like Liam Hoffman will, he has a big vat, a mixture of boiled linseed oil and um, like mineral spirits or something, or, you know, something to cut it, or turpentine or something like that. Um, and he'll put the axe's head down inside. So the entire head and the handle and the eye, they're all sitting inside that boiled linseed oil mixture and just soaking in. So that actually lets the boiled linseed oil soak into the handle from the top and soak and kind of get inside that wood. Um, my way around that doing it in the shop is that I will oil the head I'll put it in my vise, which I'll do at the end of the show today. And I'll just keep adding oil into the top and just let it soak in. So I'll get some more oil, set it on top. So it's a nice layer on there. I'll let it soak in. Um, I'll let it soak in and then I'll keep coming back and putting more and more oil in until it won't soak in anymore. Nice. I'm gonna drip the oil in there. Ooh, we can see it. Pretty nice. So that beautiful a beautiful wedge. That's Bubinga. Go all the way around. Now, unfortunately my wedge didn't go all the way out to the sides. Usually you want that wedge to be as far out as you can, but it didn't sink down in all the way. So there's some space there. Now what that can do is if you have too much space there and it's not tight enough, you know, the head can move because it's giving you some space here. Now there's ways to fix that. I could actually cut wedges of wood and put them in the front and back here, which I might do. But this is also fitting really tight in the bottom and really nice inside because of the it narrows in the inside. So I think this is gonna be pretty strong in here. Um, and honestly, I'm not gonna put anything in here 
um, unless it really does move right away. I'll, I'll use this ax and uh, see how it holds up, but right now it looks really nice. I really like this kind of dark wood here. Um, that's, there was a, there's a crack along here, so that's just oxidization inside that handle. So kind of really nice character in there with that beautiful Bubinga wedge. Just really nice and clean, that nice dark red and good contrast. Um, do you want to go outside and chop something? Uh, I didn't follow you. No, because this axe isn't sharp yet. Ah. So I was asking if we should end the video by chopping something, but this axe is not sharpened. Um, what I'll do is I'll sharpen on the grinder. So kind of start off at a you know shallow angle, go in, do the edge at a steeper angle, and then I'll and then I'll uh, kind of Add, I'll blend those angles together so you kind of create this kind of apple seed um, convex edge on the end, which will give it a lot of strength and it'll get nice and sharp. But I'll, this one will be, uh, the edge will be nice and sharp because it's a felling axe. You can see I was putting some boiled linseed oil on the axe head, just there to protect it. You know, it'll, it will occasionally leave kind of a sticky surface, but for now, you know, my basement is pretty damp. Um, I'm getting warmer, so I like to get them protected. I'll usually put um, I have a rag that's uh, inside of a can that has WD-40 inside of it, and that's usually what I'll use to clean up my axes. Um, after I use them, I'll just run them through, uh, run the WD-40 rag over them. So let's do this. Take this glove off. And I'm gonna leave it on for now. Just for a second. While in here, while I have all this extra board linseed oil on my hands. I use it on the new mallet again, which we just finished up video making this mallet using all hand tools. It worked really well today. I was really happy with it. Gave me a good four pound mallet to seat that head on to hang it, which I was doing upside down. You guys saw earlier. All right, so that's good. I oiled it all yesterday, but good to put a couple more coats on. All right, guys. Well, that's it. I will hit this real quick with a, a bit of a paper towel just to wipe off the serious excess. Just clean off the bit just a little bit. So I grab that, wipe that off. Just the thick excess that's on there. I'll leave it on the top because that needs to soak in into the top of that eye, but there we go. All hung and done. I'm actually really happy. I've been wanting to do this council tool ax for a while. And the more I look at it, I'm really happy that I put it on a full length handle. I've been tending to do shorter handles. It's just something really nice about kind of a shorter handle. But I think this has the right proportions and just looks really beautiful on this long handle. Really nice vintage handle with beautiful patina on it. Beautiful color. Nice transition. You can see now that all that kind of work blending down helped to transition that color. So it's not like a stark line where I was sanding. It looks really nice. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. I really appreciate you hanging out with us today. We went a little bit longer than we were hoping. I was thinking about an hour, but you know, it takes time to do it right. And that's what we aim for. So let me see real quick. Let's see. Boiled linseed oil is the best. Let's see, who's out here? Billy Smith. Substitutes for linseed oil. Um, yeah, you can use tongue oil. You can use Danish oil. Um, pretty much any, you know, like finishing oil will work. You know, the worst thing is to not put anything on it. So use what you have. If you don't have boiled linseed oil, use something else. But boiled linseed oil, in my opinion, works the best. All right. Brand of file for axe sharpening. Nicholson. Nicholson's are not that expensive, um, and you know they're they're one of the best for a reason. So a Nicholson mill bastard file, something like this. This will be my last tip of the day. This is the one that I actually kind of keep in the wrapper because I like to keep it nice and sharp, and I really only use it for like sharpening knives and sharpening axes. This is a. You can see it's nice and. Black diamond, single cut bastard file, 12 inch. Um, works really well, nice and sharp. Um, good for sharpening steel, sharpening axes. If you're gonna use them, if you're gonna sharpen by hand, definitely using a file. The last thing is 
you know, people ask about sharpening axes by hand or on the grinder. Um, I sharpen my axes on the grinder because I've been doing it for quite a while. I also make knives and I'm used to protecting this edge. The last thing you want to do is sharpen your axe on a grinder and overheat your edge because then you'll lose the temper and you'll lose the hardness and you need it to be hard to work really well. So if you're going to sharpen on a grinder, just take your time, be really careful, keep it cool. So sharpen, keep a bucket of water nearby. Um, that'll be my next thing I'll be doing. We'll be sharpening up this ax. So maybe I'll wait to do that and bring you guys along on the next live stream. We'll see. If you want, let me know in the comments. Maybe I'll do that and I'll do a sharpening session and show you guys how I sharpen this on the grinder. So thank you guys all so much. It's been fun hanging out. I appreciate everybody here today. Uh -huh, perfect timing. Uh, appreciate you guys hanging out and all your comments and all your love. It's good seeing everybody here and talking to you guys and hanging out. It's a little bit of less interaction today just because I was working on this, but I appreciate it. So thank you guys so much. And uh, let me know what you think. Let me know in the comments if you want to see me sharpen this ax. I'll see you guys on the next live stream. Keep your eye out for our videos coming up. we got a couple good ones. All right, thanks so much, guys.